Hey everyone, welcome to Travel Through Stories. My name is Sean and today I want to talk about the top 12 books that I read in 2021. I had a pretty incredible reading year. I read, I think, over 100 books, between 100 and 110. I'm not exactly sure on the exact number because I don't log every single book I read. If I read a book for work or something like that, um, I don't log it because I usually don't read it cover to cover. But for fiction, the number is right around 100, 110. So this list was exceptionally difficult to make. And in fact, the reason why I'm putting it out in January instead of the end of December is because in December, I was right in the middle of two books that I suspected would make this list. So I had to push everything back. So yeah, it's a top 12. And I'll include some honorable mentions at the end. I'm not very good at making lists. Some of these books I read before I started this channel, but a fair few of them I have dedicated reviews on the channel. So feel free to go check those out um, if you're so inclined. And lastly, this list doesn't include rereads, of course, because otherwise, Beowulf and Nial Saga and Blood Meridian would just be on the list every single year. Um, but anyways, here are my top 12 reads of the year in no particular order. First is The Love Songs of W.B. Du Bois by Honoré Fanon Jeffers, which may very well be my favorite new release of the year. This book is as much an American epic as any book I've read um, that has been published in the last, say, 40 years. It's primarily a Bildungsroman for this young girl, and the young woman, um, becomes the young woman, I guess, um, Ailey Garfield, as she tries to figure out how to exist in this world as a black woman. And to help her do this, she delves into her family history and the history of this country um, as, as a way of trying to figure out her own place in this world. And so in the narrative, we're constantly moving between the 1970s and 80s and 90s when Ailey Garfield is growing up, and then we're getting sucked back into the past to all the way back into the 17th century. Um, and we're following her ancestors along, but we jump back and forth throughout this narrative. It's a beautiful and moving work that explores some of the most important issues facing um, contemporary America. It's unabashedly a black feminist text, and in my opinion, it's one of the best books of the year, if not of the past 10 or 15 years. Number two is The Birds by Tarje Vesos. This book might just be in my top 10 of all time. I found it so moving, so powerful, Vesos's writing style is so simple, but he's able to convey so much depth with it. It's absolutely remarkable to read. This book is about a neurodivergent man named Mattis and his sister Hega, as they just kind of live their daily normal lives. And Mattis tries to figure out how to fit into, into this society that refuses to allow him to fit into the society because of his mental disabilities. It's full of just gorgeous symbolism as Mattis really connects to these birds that start flying over his house. It's just beautiful. It's some of my favorite prose um, that I've ever read, really, and I cannot wait to read, to be able to read Vesos in the original New York. The next up is Fernando Pessoa's The Book of Disquiet, which I read for the first time this year, and this is an absolute gem. You can flip to pretty much any page in this entire book and just get a brilliant nugget of wisdom. And one of these passages is actually where I came up with my channel name after reading it, which is just a really quick passage um, that he just keeps repeating this phrase, I am the size of what I see. But let me just read just, just a quick paragraph. Because I'm the size of what I see and not the size of my stature. Lines like these, which seem to spring into being on their own, independently of whoever says them, cleanse me of all metaphysics that I automatically tack on to life. After reading them, I step over to my window, overlooking the narrow street, I look at the immense sky and the countless stars, and I'm free with a winged splendor whose fluttering sends a shiver throughout my body. I'm the size of what I see. And it goes on, but I, ju I just love that idea of you being the size of what you see, and in some ways I find that I am the size of what I read. But I don't think much more needs to be said about Pessoa. It's an absolute masterpiece. Read it. It's brilliant. You'll love it. I promise. Next up is The Trees by Percival Everett. I did a review on this and I, in the review, I called it at the time what I thought to be probably the best new release of the year. And I didn't read every new book that was published this year, but The Trees undoubtedly is among the best books published this year. Everett explores some of the most prominent issues facing this country, namely things like racism, police brutality, and he links it all to the history of this problem and somehow adds in humor to this conversation. This book is about the legacy of lynching in America, but Everett, Everett adds in this absurdist satire that is genuinely funny. He's clearly in this book making fun of the self um, and their 
particular kind of racism, but at the same time, he's making fun of um, everyone outside of the South who laughs at the South for their own racism, as if racism only exists in the South. I feel like uh, Everett is always satirizing and then satirizing his own satire. And I really have no idea how he's able to do all of this in this, in this very short book, um, but this book is absolutely a must read, um, alongside the love songs of W.B. Du Bois, the Trees is probably my favorite um, other release of the year. Next up is Dasha Drindich's EEG, which again, I also read just before starting this channel and I didn't do a full review of it though. Uh, I really want to at some point. I just don't like the idea of reviewing a book long after I've already read it. Um, I would need to reread it in order to do a proper review, I think. But this book easily ranks among some of my favorite books of all time and I cannot wait to read more of her works. I think I have three or four of her other works on my shelf right now. Um, that I'm planning to read in 2022. And EEG is actually a sequel. I didn't know that at the time, um, and I don't think it really mattered too much. I don't think it changed my reading experience too much, but this book toes the line between documentary nonfiction and fiction as it tries to reconcile the atrocities of the Holocaust and World War II. And in fact, very similar to The Trees, it tries to reclaim some of these lives and these stories that were lost to the Holocaust or that were taken by the Holocaust. And it does this by looking this evil in the face, in this evil void, and just glaring at it in the face and exposing it. It forces us to unforget these specific evils and the criminal violence that, that occurred in the mid 20th century. It's not a light read by any means, but it's an absolutely necessary one. Um, and it's just astonishingly brilliant. And it has all of these great little anecdotes on chess, um, on contemporary art. She takes a couple of shots at Karl Uwe Knausgaard, which I don't appreciate, um, but you know, it's fair. Um, and I'm absolutely reading more Dasha Drindich soon. She's quickly becoming one of my favorite authors. Next is Karl Uwe Knausgaard's uh, The Morning Star, which it's a new Knausgaard book. It's gonna make my top reads of the year. I'll just admit, I'm a Knausgaard fanboy. I like pretty much anything that he's ever written. Um, and this book is pretty exceptional. It, is quite different from the My Struggle series that he's much more famous for, but he maintains a same sort of narrative voice in this novel as he does in, in those novels. But this novel is perhaps much more closely related to his earlier work, A Time for Everything, which looked at interactions between humans and angels throughout history. But here in The Morning Star, he is interested in this interaction with the supernatural or with the fantastic or with the divine that's what he's most interested in. Um, but there is a horror uh, tinge to this novel. It's, 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 it has a very creepy and uh, horrific atmosphere. It's about nine characters in Norway who, after this giant morning star appears in the sky, they begin to experience unsettling and scary events. It's very uh, interested in exploring the uncanny. But the general atmosphere of this book is just absolutely wonderful. Um, it's so disturbing and creepy and unsettling and just makes for a really wonderful reading experience. I'm looking forward to the rest of the books in this series, which I think it was just, just announced a couple weeks ago that it's going to be a five book series. So looking forward to reading that. Next is Sergio de la Pava's A Naked Singularity. Again, another book that I read just before starting this channel. Um, and de la Pava quickly skyrocketed to being one of my contemporary authors. In fact, right after I read this, I read his um, the, uh, his other book, The Lost Empress, which a lot of people didn't like as much as A Naked Singularity. I thought it was pretty good, but A Naked Singularity is just an incredible, incredible book. It's a maximalist work that has a narrative voice very similar to David Foster Wallace um, or Zadie Smith. And it's about this young lawyer in New York City. And Sergio de la Pava, by the way, is also a, a defense attorney in uh, in, in New York City. So he has all of this legal jargon at his hands and he explores the, the legal system and the, the corruption of the legal system and how um, capitalism has sort of infiltrated the legal system or has created that certain kind of legal system. So it's very much a satire of, of the American legal system. But this novel is also a, a heist novel as this young lawyer gets caught up in this grand heist that makes this whole book read like a thriller. It's very, very enthralling. Again, it's maximalist, so it's very difficult to s summarize the plot and do it any justice at all, but um, I can't recommend it enough. I mean, it's it, it's it's fun, 
it's really, really funny at times. Again, his narrative voice is, is, is very, very funny. Um, and it's just a great book. I'll now just read anything that he writes. I'm looking forward to seeing what he does next. Next up is Evan Dara's Permanent Earthquake, which was released back in May, I believe, um, to, or June, uh, to absolutely no fanfare. Um, Evan Dara is one of the most mysterious American authors working today, um, but he's also one of the best. This book is a post-apocalyptic novel. It takes place on this unnamed Caribbean island where there is a, well, a permanent earthquake. The world is constantly shaking and it's shaking so much that our characters need to wear like protective gear. They have to wear mouth guards um, as they're constantly knocked off their feet and just beat up by this world. The conceit is quite original. I find way too many post-apocalyptic novels to be very unoriginal in their conceit, but the execution in this novel is really what makes the novel great. It's a really smart book that touches on everything from climate change to the noise of social media to class struggle. Brilliant, brilliant book by one of America's, one of contemporary America's greatest living authors. Next up is The Eighth Life by Nino Hartchevelli. I read this back in August and September, right at the beginning of the school year. Um, so I never really got around to fully reviewing it. I got kind of swept up in, 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 in the school year and I was worried that this book was almost too big to review, right? It's, I mean, what, 900 pages. The, the audiobook is almost 50 hours in length. It's a massive maximalist epic of the 20th century. It's a family epic. It focuses on this Georgian family and we witness all of the events of, of the 20th century from their perspective. And for me, the first half of this book is some of the best historical fiction I've ever read. The, the parts about, about the rise of Stalinism, uh, the parts about World War II are just utterly sublime. And if you're really interested in 20th century Western history, um, I really think you should read it. It brought a perspective that I never fully considered, um, that of a Georgian family. And the characterization, the characters in this novel are just so, so interesting. Um, there are really too many to talk about in this review, um, but this really is just some of the best uh, historical fiction that I've ever read. And it's easily, easily one of the best books that I read this year, if not one of the best books I've read um, in the past few years. Next up is Parallel Lies by Peter Nadash. This is a book that I still don't quite know what I think about it. I don't think it's a perfect book by any means, and I'm not even sure that I liked it, to be honest, but it was such a unique and engrossing reading experience that there are so many moments in this book that will stay with me forever, whether I like it or not. So I just had to add it to this list. And I'm not even gonna try to give a brief summary of this book. It is one of the most sprawling books I've ever read. It touches on everything from, from Nazism to, everything related to sex and gender. And I do think that this book is probably best read in a class or with a group, as there are so many connections that I absolutely missed. I'm not the strongest reader, so um, perhaps you would fare better uh, th than I did, but this book is about as, as grand in scale as you can possibly get. I mean, it's, I think the audiobook is like 60 hours. I mean, it's close to 1200 pages. Um, it's about as big of a book as you can possibly get. It's incredibly messy. I think it's supposed to be messy, but it's just a really unique reading experience that I'm glad I read the book, but I'm also very glad that I'm finished with the book. Next is The Secret Service by Wendy Walker, which this is the book, by the way, that is fully responsible for this list being a, a top 12 books rather than a top 10 books because I was reading this in December and I absolutely loved it and I needed to make room on this list for it. I just posted a review of this book um, just a week ago or so. So if you're interested in it, go check out that review. Um, this book, I wasn't thinking I was going to like it when I, I first got it. Um, it absolutely blew me away. One, one of just the, 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 the pro style in this book is so unique, it's so Baroque, it's so gorgeous and lush um, and encyclopedic. Um, it's incredible. Mesmerizing book. Absolutely loved it. Highly, highly recommended. Can't wait to read more of her books. And the last in the top 12 is The Copenhagen Trilogy by Tova Ditlison, which may very well be one of my favorite memoirs of all time. I haven't read any of Ditlison's fiction, um, but this memoir blew me away. It's 
follows Ditlevson in her, her childhood and in her adolescence growing up in Copenhagen in like the 40s and 50s. So it offers a really unique perspective of, of World War II and actually because it kind of just reminded me that normal people needed to keep living their normal lives during this time period. It wasn't, the war wasn't all encompassing. But for me, the most compelling part of this memoir by far was the third section, which is called Dependency, which focuses on her early career as a writer and some of her early marriages and stuff like that. And it was some of the most heartbreaking um, stories that I've ever read. But it also has this glimmer of hope in that she found solace in art, in literature. All she wanted to do was be a writer. And this refuge that she found in literature is really quite beautiful, but her life was just really hard to witness. Uh, it's very, very heartbreaking stuff. Very, very heavy stuff, but gorgeous, gorgeous memoir. Highly recommend it if you get the chance. Now let me really quickly go through some honorable mentions because I, again, I read so many great books this year um, and I feel like it wouldn't, it would be a disservice to a lot of these books if they didn't get just mentioned quickly in this video. The first of which is The World of Yesterday by Stefan Zweig, which is, if you ask me another day, this might make the list instead of the Copenhagen trilogy. Uh, insanely good memoir. Um, so, so good. I have a full review on it. Go, re go, go watch that if you'd like. Um, really great memoir. Next is Femme by Magna uh, Carnecci, which this is probably the book I'm the most sad that it didn't make the full list because this book is just a disjointed feminist text that is so, so good. It, it touches on all different aspects of the feminine experience. The prose is gorgeous. The ideas are pertinent. The structure of the novel is, is well executed. Just an amazing, amazing book. Great feminist text. Next up, um, very quickly, is Linda Bostrom Knausgaard's October Child. Just a really powerful meditation on memory and uh, mental health and institutionalization. Um, it's one of those books that has really stayed with me. I think about it quite a bit um, when it comes to thinking about mental health and thinking about um, how we treat mental health in the modern world. Um, really, really interesting book. Next is Jan Foss's The Other Name. I only read the first book this year, um, and I suspect, because I'm planning on reading the next two in this series, um, in, well, the next couple of weeks, um, I suspect that next year, or 2022, this year, will be filled with Fossa. So I didn't want to add him to this, add, add him to this list, um, but this book is incredible. Um, I will be doing full reviews of, of that entire series in the near future. Jan Foss is fantastic. One of my favorite living authors. One of my favorite authors, period. Um, incredible stuff. Next is 2666 by Roberto Bolaño, which you know is a good reading year when Roberto Bolaño doesn't make the actual top 12. And the reason why he didn't make the top 12, I found this book to be utterly captivating and in incredibly good, obviously. You don't need me telling you that 2666 is a good book. But there's just something with Bolaño that I don't fully click with. Again, I really enjoyed it, but there were just too many moments that I really couldn't see why they connected or how they connected um, that I think the problem might be on me. I think I need to reread this book very soon. Um, really, I mean, really great book, obviously, but there was something a bit off for me that I can't quite put into words. And then just two more quick honorable mentions. Um, Ducks Newburyport by Lucy Elman. I really enjoyed this book. Um, I like the idea of the, the, the structure of the prose style, the, how it's all kind of set up just as a series of references. And I think it's a really interesting spin on the stream of consciousness narrative structure. I think it does really get at how most modern people think. Um, and I thought it was brilliant at replicating this. The main reason why it's on, not on the top 12 list is because I really don't know why it needed to be so long. I know its length was kind of the point, but I do think that it could have cut 300 or 400 pages and the effect of the book wouldn't have changed that much. But I realize I'm in the minority here. Um, it is a remarkable book. I really, really enjoyed it. And then the last honorable mention is just anything that Annie or No writes. Uh, she's an author I discovered this year um, and I read three of her books and I really intend to read more. She's just an incredible author. But anyways, that's my list. Um, I'm quite happy with my reading in 2021. I discovered so many new authors um, and so many new books that uh, have quickly risen to my top books of all time. And most of those books I found via uh, BookTube or through Twitter or Instagram. 
the latter two I have never been on um, until, start, until starting this channel has forced me to go on those platforms. Um, and I've really enjoyed my time on them. So I'm quite glad that I started this channel. It has really made my reading life much, much deeper and much more worthwhile. Um, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure reading all these books and forcing myself to think more deeply about them because of this channel. And I hope that 2022 is filled with as many good books as 2021 was. So for now, thanks for watching.